All right, welcome class. This is your first uh, screencast practicum tutorial for spring 2020. And what we're going to do today is just to get to know the very first piece of software we're going to use in, uh, in this class, which is QGIS. And we're going to get started again, uh, as I mentioned in class, each of these practicums sort of builds on the first project that you're going to do. So as we go through the semester, we have the four projects, so every practicum is building some aspect of you know, each of those individual projects. So the first thing you want to do is to get the sort of start data, or the, the tutorial data that goes along with these videos, and you'll log into the um, course Google Drive, and this is the drive right here, uh, and you should go to the uh, subfolder that's called Projects, and we'll go to Project 1, and then we have the description, uh, and we have the SPV underscore survey dot zip. What you want to do is to right click on that uh, survey dot zip, and then go down to download in the dialog. It says too big to scan for viruses. I didn't put any viruses in it. If you're you know here in the lab, you can, don't worry about the computers, and if you're on your own computer, also don't worry about it. Okay, it's 303 megabytes, so you want to make sure you're on a good internet connection. Download anyway, and it's going to automatically, if you're in the lab, download it into your downloads folder. Meanwhile, you can uh, just double click on the project one, and it should open up in a new tab in a Google um, Docs window right here, and so you can kind of help, you know, follow along. Now, this first practicum, you won't really need to look at the project description file too much because we're just really getting to know QGIS, but there it is. Um, so you can either navigate to your downloads folder or if you're you know you've in the lab computer you can right click on the little download thing and say show in folder and you'll see spv underscore survey dot zip and what you wanted to do here is to right click on it and then uh, you can just we're going to move it to a more sensible place than your downloads so you could do cut uh, and then up here is how you navigate on uh, this version of Linux. So we go to the home folder, which is the main folder for all of your stuff. And here we can right click and tap new folder. And I'm going to put QGIS projects. And I'm going to put my last name. You can put your last name. And this is where I'm going to put all my projects for QGIS from on this computer from here you know, into the infinity. So we're going to double click into that. And now we can right click and paste that SPV survey, uh, survey zip. This is a zip file format, so you need to extract it. Depending on which computer you're using, you may have to install like WinZip or something on your Windows computer. On these ones, you just right click and then you can do uh, extract here. And it will unzip it automatically, and then you have this SPV survey folder. Now, this guy here, this zip, technically you can. Uh, you can go ahead and delete it at this point, but you might want to keep it around in case you mess something up. You can always just re-extract it and you're back to square one. So if we open SPV survey, you see it's organized exactly the way I showed you in class. So we have SPV, SPV survey as the main folder. Inside that is a project file. This is a specific file format for QGIS. Then we have one folder for rasters, one folder for vectors. If we click into rasters, we see we have only one raster. This is an uh, Sampasquale orthos.tiff. This is an imagery file, uh, base imagery file. When we go back here, we can go into vectors and we see we have two folders and we have 2017 structures outline. And all of these are actually one singular file. This is called the shape file format. You see this particular one is 2017 structures outlines.shp. That's the main shape file, but you need to have all these other ones with it. That's the weirdness of this particular file format. This is an Esri format that has become very, very popular, so you'll come across shape files a lot. You'll notice how they all have the same uh, prefix, 2017 structures outline, and then they have a different extension, QPJ, SHX, PRJ, DBF, CPG. So like I said, this is the main, uh, this is the main one. This contains all the topology. This is the database, or this is the table, basically, that it contains the attribute information. This is the projection information, which we'll talk about at a later date. Uh, this is another sort of that for QGIS. Uh, this is some uh, metadata, and again, some more metadata. So 
mainly you would point the program at this one, and it, but these should all be in the same folder. Otherwise, you'll get like file broken or file not found error. And then we can go back over here. We have a survey grid. This is also a shape file. And you see the same kinds of, uh, you know, same kinds of companion files for the shape file here as well. So let's just go back up into the SPV survey folder, and we can start QGIS now. We can do it multiple ways. If QGIS is installed, you could actually double click on this right here. But I'm going to show you uh, just if you want to launch QGIS. I've put it here in, uh, on these computers, so if you put your mouse in the bottom left corner, you get this thing that pops up with some special shortcuts for your programs. Otherwise, you can click on apps, and you can type QGIS, and then it pops up. So QGIS desktop. And it should be version 3.4, which is the current long-term supported release. That's the one that we're going to be working with. And this is the window for QGIS. And since we have a project already saved, the easiest thing to do is to go to Project, Open, and then Navigate to where we where we actually have it. So in this case, we want to go uh, to our QGIS projects, ULA, SPV Survey, and then SPV, SPV Survey QGS. That's the project file. You can double click that, and it opens up. Uh, you may get this warning about the project being older, but don't worry about that. The software is smart enough to know uh, what's going on here. So by default, uh, when I save this, uh, I basically have just two layers. That's what we're looking at here, the base imagery and then a survey grid. And I'm just going to give you some rundown of uh, the window here in QGIS and where your basic tools are at. So the main window that we're looking at here in the center, this is the map display. And this is where all of your actual GIS uh, files, the spatial information will all show up here and you can interact with it. You can move it around by clicking and dragging, just sort of we're using this little hand tool by default. Um, if I use the mouse scroll wheel, I can zoom in. Each click of the scroll wheel is one zoom increment. Uh, there are also some specialized uh, zoom tools I'll show you in a minute. But you can see this is a very, this is where you see the actual files themselves. Over here on the left, we have two panels by default. Uh, we could add more panels, but right now we're going to leave this as default. We have a browser panel and a layers panel. And here in the layer manager, this allows us to turn on and off the view of specific layers. And actually, the order in which they show up is the order in which they're displayed. So whatever is on top in the layer manager is what's physically going to be displayed on top in the uh, display window, the map display window. So you can play around with that for sure and see how that goes. And that's really uh, useful. So you're going to have like five or six maps in here. You have to know the order is going to be important. And of course, you can turn the view on and off. And you know you can see each layer or the other layer. Now you'll see that some layers have some transparency by default. These vector layers you can see through them. You can also turn on some transparency, which I'll show you here in a little bit as well for all the other kinds of layers. Indeed. Now over here is the browser. This is basically a nice shortcut view to like browse around on your system to uh, look for new folders, new files, and stuff to add. So we have the same home folder and you can find your QGIS project files and you can go in there and if you follow my format for organizing your projects this will all be very sensical and make sense. A uh, useful shortcut is when you have a saved project like we just did we opened this from a QGIS project it has this project home and that just basically starts you at exactly the same file folder as uh, where your QGIS or .QGS project file is actually saved. So this project home is exactly the same as starting at SPV survey. It's just a nice short, nice shortcut to get you started in that project home. And again, if you followed my uh, directory structure, you'll see your rasters and your vectors organized very neatly under there. And it's super easy to find all the data files that go with that project. And you can see here, it's also simplified for you, the view of those shape files. It only shows you the one name.shp because it knows that those other files are in there. And it also knows that you don't need to click on them, that they, but that they should be there uh, connected to this one. So what we can do here is we can actually import a, uh, a new layer. And the one that I have highlighted right now, which is 2017 structure outlines.shp. 
and we can just double click on it and you can see on the map display we have this new layer in orange and what these are, are actually field data from some of my surveys in this area of southern Italy that we're looking at here uh, and right now everything's coded the same colors and we're going to work with this data for project one so we've now loaded that up onto our map display and we can see that since it's on top it's technically if I zoom in here going to display over the top of the survey grid and if I move it down to underneath the survey grid the survey grid is now going to be on top of it and if I move it down to the very bottom it's going to be underneath the orthos and so it's going to be disappeared from our view right now but if I uh, make the orthos go invisible, then you can see that it's actually there underneath the whole time. So let's go ahead and put that back on top right here and zoom back out to a normal zoom level. Okay, so I showed you a couple of shortcuts. So by default, when it opens up, it typically has the hand tool. And this is the click and drag uh, tool, so you can pan around in there. Uh, uh, there are a couple of shortcuts that you can use with it. Um, like I said, with a mouse, scroll wheel is probably the easiest one to use in for, for zooming. But let's say you wanted to more precisely zoom in on just like this square and you didn't want to sort of mess around like in and out trying to get it centered on all that. Well, we have this toolbar up here at the very top that has some very useful uh, basically tools to help you interact with the mass map display. And right here we have two zoom tools. Actually, we have three and four zoom tools here all together. Uh, and I'll start with this one that's got the plus sign zoom in and so we can just click on it and we can see now we have a little magnifying glass with a plus in it and so now what I do is I click and hold and then drag a window so I drag this little blue square and whatever we're you know whatever size that blue square is we're gonna zoom into that basically in the map display so that's really useful if you want to zoom right in on one area and you don't want to worry about using the scroll wheel and you can see the scroll wheel still will work while we're in that uh, mode, but this helps us be a little bit more precise. Now let's say I want to zoom back out and I can do the same thing and what this does is it takes the little blue area and it zooms out by this uh, sort of proportion to which that is inside the main map display. So it's a little bit less intuitive but it makes some sense once you practice it. So if I, if I make that square big it doesn't zoom out very much at all but if I make it really small it zooms out a lot, right? So that's just a sort of simple uh, tool to help you sort of narrow in on the area that you're sort of interested. You can zoom in a lot or a little. And again, you can still use that scroll wheel. Now this one-to-one -one right here, zoom to native resolution, means you zoom in to the best display resolution where the size of the little pixels in there is uh, at 100% zoom, basically. So, so the the maximum zoom at which it still looks unpixelated essentially. So that's pretty useful if you just want to quickly zoom into that uh, native resolution and it'll tell you the scale down here 1 to 941 magnifier is a hundred percent right? Okay and then this one that has the three arrows pointing off of it is zoomed to the full extent so every layer has its boundaries where there's no more data in the layer and this quickly lets you zoom to the full boundary so that all the data layer uh, is uh, displayed there. All the, the extent of your data is there. And then you have a uh, zoom to layer. So if you have a specific layer that is highlighted over here in the layer tree in the layer manager and you click the uh, zoom to layer, it's going to zoom to the extent of just that layer, not to all the layers combined. And so uh, in this case I have selected the structures outlines and it's of a smaller extent than the ortho so it zooms in. But if I go to the orthos and I click zoom to layer, it'll zoom out right to the extent of the ortho layer as well. And then finally, I have this one, which is zoom last. It just takes me to the last zoom. So if I zoom way in like so, I can go zoom last and it takes me to the exact last zoom I was looking at. And I can keep going back and back and back five or six or seven or eight or ten times until it runs out of memory in there. And then I can also go forward now after I've zoomed back. I can zoom forward. So I can keep going back to different zooms. So this is super useful if you've got a nice like tight uh, zoom like this and then you've got a far out zoom and you want to very quickly kind of flip back and forth between them, you can kind of do that like so. Super helpful when you're exploring data and just sort of looking around and trying to figure out what's going on in your data. So those are the basic uh, areas. 
point out just a couple more things in here. There is uh, these drop downs at the top, and these have a lot of tools that we'll get into as we go on, uh, particularly to add layers for dealing with plugins for specific manipulation tools or query tools or mathematical tools for rasters and vectors and that kind of stuff. And of course, we have our project menu over here. We could make a new project, uh, which would blank everything out, and we could add new data layers, and then we could save it. And if we're happy with what we've got here, we can save. And what we're saving here is the project file, so updates to the project file. And what that will do is to save every single layer that we see here is going to be saved in the project file and the path to get to it. So it's important that they're saved. The physical files are actually saved within your directory tree. This will just save out the, the which layers are currently loaded. It will save the order, which one is on top and which one is in the middle and the bottom, etc. It will save any styling that we do as well. It will actually save the current zoom extent. So if we're zoomed way in, next time we open up that project file, if we saved it, zoomed in, it's going to start zoomed in as well. So that's what that save does over here. And then there are a few other things, again, later on as we get more comfortable with QJS, we'll sort of get into what they do. You can access these also as quick menus here. So you have save project, save project as if you want to change the name. Let's say you want to have a, a two versions of the project where you have different layers and different styles. You can do that. And uh, then there are these tools over here, which are query tools, which I'm going to get to in just a second here as well. And then these are loading, little shortcuts to load in specific kinds of data files. These are um, digitizing tools, which we will talk at, about in think maybe the next uh, practicum or the one afterwards and then a few other special purpose menu items over here and then finally along the bottom we have coordinates so if we move our mouse cursor around these are actually the projected coordinate systems like latitude and longitude uh, or UTM depending on what coordinate system we're in uh, displayed of where the mouse key actually is uh, we have the scale that tells us what scale one to whatever that we're zoomed in at, so that means one unit of measurement on the ground equals how many uh, units of measurement here on the screen. And a magnifier, so if we wanted to just apply some uh, false zoom and not change the scale, we can do that too. That's just like, you know, magnifying, so I don't usually use that. Technically, you can rotate the image off of true north if you really want to, but usually we leave that okay. And then this tells us the projection information. This is a specific code. I call it an EPSG code, and I'll talk about all of that when we talk about CRSs and projections a little later on. But a lot of little useful heads up information over here. One more thing about the map display before we sort of move on uh, we can actually add uh, a few interesting things that we may want. Uh, if we go to the view of uh, menu item and we go down to where it says decorations, we can add a couple of things, including usefully a scale bar. And we'll get this little dialog scale bar decoration. Right now it's disabled, so we'll check the enable scale bar. And then I'm just going to hit apply so you can actually see it. And uh, let's see. Click OK. And where did our scale bar get to? It's right up there in the corner, right? So it was a little dark when we first saw it. Um, and we'll, by default, this is the way it's styled. It's called tick down style. But let's say I wanted to uh, modify that. I can go back to decoration scale bar and get my thing again. And I can change that from tick down to, let's say, a box scale. And I can apply. And now I have this classic black and white scale. Um, I can change the size of it if I really wanted to by clicking through here. Uh, and that may not do anything because it didn't go far enough. I can change the color of the bar if I really wanted to make it be red. I could make it be red on that side, uh, including the white side. I could change that to, uh, I don't know, teal. I don't necessarily recommend the outlines to be in those colors. So let's go ahead and stick it back to uh, black and to black and apply. So that's sort of nicer. Change the font if I really wanted to. I could change the size of the font. I could change the actual font itself. I've got all these crazy fonts in here I could choose from. Uh, whatever, like so. Maybe I like that one a little better. Maybe I don't, right? And then I can change where it is. Top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And I can change how far away it's going to show up from the edge over here. So I can increase that. You can see it'll move it over. 
and I can move it up off the bottom like so. So I can actually have pretty fine placement over that uh, and I can do this by millimeters, I can do it by percentage of the screen, or I can even do it by number of actual pixels. So these are different units that we can use. Percentage is a pretty useful thing to do. Okay, so there's that. There's our uh, scale bar. Another decoration that's pretty useful is a north arrow and you can uh, you know, style the North Arrow any way that you that you want. If you click this where it says custom SVG, you get actually quite a few different uh, SVGs you can choose from. There's quite a few different North Arrow styles. So maybe you'll pick one that's a little better than the default uh, windrows. You can apply and then you can stick it again in whatever corner you want it to be in top left or whatever. And again, you can do the same thing, move it over from the side of the edge. And then there are a couple other decorations. You can put a copyright layer, you can put a grid uh, if you really wanted to. We already have a survey grid, so two grids will get a little confusing, so I'm just going to turn that off. So those are kind of nice things to help you figure out what's going on or just to make some sense of what's going on over here. So we're almost getting ready to, to do some serious business, but what I want you to do is to pause my video for a second and to play around with some of those tools, get familiar with uh, navigating, see what some of these other things do. Uh, for example, this uh, zoom pan button uh, over here, the zoom buttons, the pan buttons, uh, that kind of thing, right? So just, you know, the other useful thing is often if you hold your mouse key over something, it tells you exactly what it is. So that's called a tool tip, it's pretty useful. So just sort of play around for a minute and figure things out, and then we'll do the second half of our old tutorial after that. Okay, I'm gonna assume you paused and you played around, and what we wanna do now is to actually start querying and to look at how we can style some of our objects. So the first thing I wanna do is, is to show you how to style. So over here in the Layers dialog, we can right click on it, we've got a pull down menu, and we can go down to a couple of different things. Let's go down to the very bottom, properties and it should pop up a dialog like this. Now we can get to it through right clicking or actually there's a shortcut you can just double click and it will open up properties and it should open up to the exact same place. So depending on whether we're looking at vector or raster will the properties layer properties dialog will look a little different. This happens to be a uh, vector uh, file so we have a lot of uh, cool things like symbology and labels and diagrams and 3D view and a bunch of other stuff here. Um, so you can uh, eventually click, you know, we'll use a few of these later on, uh, but you can click through and see what some of these things are. Some of them are grayed out by default. Uh, some of them won't be uh, available. But eventually you want to settle on this symbology tab, which is usually the one that is selected by default. And this allows us to change the color and size of the lines going on forward. And eventually we'll use this when we talk about thematic maps as well, but right now we're just going to be leaving it alone as single symbol we have this little thing that says line and simple line. And it's nested like this because you can have multiple kinds of lines in your project uh, depending on how you do it. So for now, it's going to say line. We could technically, we can change color and do a few things from this layer, but if we want finer control, we can go in here, just click on where it says simple line. And now we have a few more fine controls. So the first useful thing is to change the color. And we've seen this a little bit. I just showed you with the North Arrow and the um, map scale, but we have uh, a really nice color picker. By default, we have this view right here. We can move this around, and wherever the crosshairs is, that's the color that we're showing. And then we can change the darkness of that color and brightness by scrolling up here. Alternatively, we can go right over here, and we can move these sliders around, and you can see how the crosshairs are moving as I do that. So this is a very useful way to pick the color. And I want to note that over here, you can get right back to that exact same color. So what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to do control C to copy uh, this little hashtag symbol, which is an HTML color notation. And I move it around like so. You can see how it changes. I can delete that and hit control V to paste it in. And I can go right back to that other color. The other thing I can do is to add a little shortcuts uh, by hitting, you know, whenever I have my crosshairs on a color I like, I can put it over here, and that way I can go back and forth by clicking on them. And of course, I have the current color, I can go back by tapping on that. 
Now if I don't like this color input, I can click up here in these tabs and I've got a color wheel where I can move around in this triangle of lightness and I can move around the circle to get to my different hues, right? And then I have the same you know, possibilities like that. And then I have a recent colors dialog or a standard colors palette where it's like very simplified. I can pick from a nice predefined uh, palettes, uh, you know, things that exist over there. And then finally, I also have this little color pick picker over here and I can go up to my map and I, wherever my, my cursor actually is down here, that's the color that's going to be put into the window over there and I can click it and now I've got the same green that was in whatever pixel I clicked on over there. So lots of really useful color tools over here. What I will do is I'm going to pick, I'm just going to go back to this wheel over here. I'm going to get a nice uh, visible color. I've got a green background so I don't want a green color. I want something that's sort of bright red and that looks pretty good to me. So I'm going to click OK. And now you see the color of my line is red and if I hit apply you can see all of my features in the background have, have now turned red. But they're also still pretty narrow at this uh, scale, 1 to 89, 85. So what I can do is to change the width. So right now we have widths in uh, formats of millimeters. And I can use these little buttons to go up or I can type directly. And if I do that, now I've got a uh, width of 0.66 millimeters. If I want to, I can choose different units, map units, and I can hit apply. And oh my goodness, because map units are probably like kilometers. Uh, so it just blew up the thing over there. We do inches, meters at scale, and now we can see that the scale is actually in 0.66 meters. So maybe I want to make these be 5 meters in diameter. I can hit apply, and now I actually have the width of the lines as something that's actually meaningful for the map itself. They're actually helping to uh, help you identify scale as well, knowing that these lines are 5 meters thick, right? Now, if I don't want them to be solid, I can go to this line stroke style and I can make them be dashed, like so. Or I can pick a variety of patterns as well. Uh, and I can change the corners to be very sharp or a little rounded. Usually bevel is fine. Technically, if I want the, the lines to be offset from the actual features, I can do that, although it's not typically useful. I can make a custom dash pattern if I wanted to and put how many dashes and spaces. That might be useful if you have a lot of different styles. <coughs> but you can see how you can get really precise with your, uh, with your information over here. Now one thing I should also show you is that you can click on the colors and there's an opacity slider. And if I want these, uh, this line to be a little bit transparent, I can change that from 100% opaque to like 50% opaque. And if I do that, if I zoom in now, I'm just going to click OK, we can actually see that we can see through them a little bit 50%. And you can actually uh, mess with that uh, a little bit. And it, that can be an advantage if you want to sort of stack a couple of different pieces of information together. So if I go even lighter than that, let's say like 15%, you can see they get really faint and you can really see through them. And if I go 100% um, again, now it's solid, right? And this is useful because this is transparency just for this particular set of lines. And if I had more kinds of lines in this layer, we could set the opacities differently by changing the opacity of their colors. If I want to change the total opacity, I can do it for the entire layer up here under the just general line right here. So I can apply. In this case, because we only have one set of lines, it's, it's almost functionally the same as doing it here or in the simple line. But if we have multiple kinds of lines, then you can see how we can make globally all of them be tr somewhat transparent or individually one line versus another line become transparent. So I want you to mess with that a little bit and see how you can change the way things are displayed a little bit. And I want you to think about uh, how you do that. And eventually, like I said, we're going to use some thematic mapping to make the colors a little bit more meaningful as well. Okay, let's talk about querying. Okay, so I mentioned earlier in class that uh, essentially all these vector formats are going to have uh, 
oh wait, before I get into querying, let's look at the orthos uh, layer properties. And here we have multiband color, we can get single band gray, and it turns it into grayscale, so you can see that. Uh, in this case, it's multiple bands because we have red, green, and blue. If we we're looking at satellite imagery, we might have infrared or ultraviolet or thermal or something like that as well. Uh, you can uh, mess with the contrast, so you can enhance the contrast. So stretching and clipping. Uh, in this particular case, it's not doing very much, but in some cases, it might make uh, faint features look a little bit uh, sharper. In this case, it's not doing much. Uh, well, we, could, we could change the min and max value, stretch and clip, and there we go. We have a contrast stretch. So things got a little lighter, but some of the features popped a little bit. When we get into imagery analysis, some of this stuff will make a little bit more sense. We'll have more time on all that, um, but we can go back to no enhancement over here. If we have a DEM, which we'll get at another time, we can actually do some uh, various color renderings over here. But we can change the contrast like that over here. We can change the brightness, making it brighter. Oh wow, we made it almost, almost completely white over here. So let's make it go down. We can reduce the contrast as well. Uh, we can increase the saturation, apply. And oh gosh, we really messed it up. We hit the reset button, apply, and we're back to, to where we started as well, right? So we can actually uh, mess with these to our heart's content and then very simply go back. Okay, so that's briefly uh, raster uh, information properties as well. Uh, let's go to how we uh, query some information. So I mentioned that all these uh, vector files have some database or a table attached to them. So we can right click on the file and we can go down to open attribute table and that's what we're looking at right here. We have the data table associated with it. And we can see that there's actually quite a lot of information associated with each of these individual vector objects. So each line or each little polygon, a bunch of information associated with it. This is all my survey data that we collected while we were in the field. And we have some of these information, uh, their codes over here, all the columns are coded, wall heights, wall thicknesses, number of walls, widths, you know, all this stuff. And if you want to talk a little bit more about what some of this stuff is, we can certainly do that. Um, but uh, what we can do is use this table to uh, highlight, for example, a specific feature on the map. So let's say I'm down here at uh, feature location number one, uh, 183, and I want to highlight that on the map. What I can do is I can right click on this cell or on this line uh, anywhere when it's highlighted and I can go zoom to feature. And what we see is the feature is now zoomed into and it's actually highlighted in yellow over here on the map. So it might zoom way in and you may need to zoom back out to say, well, what's going on over here? But now I can zoom to any feature and you can see there we go, right? Um, if I want to highlight the row that's highlighted by clicking on the number of the row is what gets highlighted. And you can see as I move the, the row highlight, the map highlight itself also changes as well. And again, right click, zoom to feature, zooms way in on that specific feature. And then the other thing I can do is pan to feature. If I don't want to change the zoom level, uh, I can pan to that feature, especially useful if it's within the same area. Now these are all structures on the same properties by the law, so basically it's panning around is pretty useful as well. So that's a simple way to do that from go going basically from the uh, database table view to the map view. Now what if I wanted to highlight something in here and have that be highlighted over here? Well we have to go back to our map display tools up here at the top and we have our select feature by single click or by rectangle drag. So if I select that feature by clicking on it and we scroll around in here, let's see, should have showed up as highlighted, there it is right there, Del Pozzo. Uh, and if I click on this, now I'm back at Del Pozzo. This is a different property right next to our Vadala property which we can scroll back up and we can see if we click around in here how we're just moving the highlights around in there as well. 
Now I can highlight quite a few of them at a time by clicking and dragging a box. Now all of them will be highlighted. And same deal over here, I can hold the shift key down and I can highlight all of these or I can hit control and I can click individually like so. And all of them will start to be highlighted over here as well. And so let's say I've got a bunch highlighted and I want to clear it quickly. I can click this little clear button right here. If I put the tool tip, it should say deselect all features. And I have the same thing over here. So if I'm highlighting this, I can deselect those features as well. So that's useful for showing me, just highlighting me, what is in, you know, what this record is and where it is over here. Uh, and uh, same vice versa, what's this feature and where is it in the table as well. And what I'll say is I was sort of manually scrolling around, but you do have the opportunity to, uh, let's see where it is. Uh, zoom map to the selected rows. Yeah, that's the one I want to do. So you can zoom in on, select, on multiple rows and that kind of stuff as well. Right? So it's super useful to do that as well. So you can get to the whole extent uh, as well. Um, there are a few other things you can do, like move that selection to the top um, of, the, of the folder file. So that helps you just sort of keep track of the ones that you really wanted and not look at the ones before. So as long as I'm highlighting, that's going to happen. So I want to make sure I turn that on and off. That's a one that you turn on and it stays that way until you turn it off. So that's something you want to be aware of. Eventually you have some edit tools, but we won't talk about that as well. Um, okay, so that's all great. What if I'm in here and I just want to get a quick shot information, I don't want to pull the whole table up. So that's when we would use this little button, which is um, basically the information dialog. And it pops up a new little window over here, identify results, and I click on this thing and it shows me uh, just that row from the table. And you can see all the same information is in here. It's a real quick way to identify what's going on over here. And of course, I can hide and show a few different things, um, but you know we can easily get the same kind of information that we can get um, from the table, but just for that one particular uh, object as well. Um, there are other ways to select features. We can do it with uh, value. And this is a whole like calculation field. These are a little bit more advanced, so I'm going to leave them for a, a, a future time. But hopefully, what you've got right now are the basic tools for how to sort of move and load data in and move data around. And what I want to say is that as soon as you're happy with the way your project looks, make sure that you save it or save, a, save as and save a copy of it so that you can uh, get started right from the same place afterwards. And that becomes more important as we start to style these things with thematic maps and all that kind of stuff in project two or three or whatever it is that we're going to get to. So I think that, that about does it for uh, practicum number one. And again, I will be here in the lab on Thursdays if you want to ask questions about that. Uh, happy GISing. Thank <laughs> you.